We now take you into a service already in progress where Pastor Ashish exhorts the congregation and leads them in making the declaration. And right after this is a life-changing message for you. Whoever speaks to the mountain, he says, remove and be cast into the sea. And you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that what you say will come to pass. Jesus said, you will have whatever you say. He prefixed this by saying, have faith in God. So this is how we release our faith in God. We have faith in God, but how do you release that? How do you express your faith in God? Here's one way that Jesus taught us. He said, if you have faith, you speak to the mountain. You command it to move. It will move. And nothing will be impossible to you. Amen? So it's something all of us can do. Is that right? All of us can do this. Whoever can say to the mountain. Whoever says to the mountain. You believe in your heart. You say with your mouth. Is what Jesus taught us. That's how we release our faith. One of the ways we release our faith. And that's why every Sunday, almost every Sunday, we stand up together and make our declaration. So let's stand up to our feet this morning as we make our declaration, doing what Jesus taught us in His Word. I want you to hold your Bibles high up in the air. Say this out loud with me. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing. To many people, I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. As we announced last Sunday, we are going to be using this book, The Presence of God. We just came out last Sunday, uh, over the next few Sundays as we study the Word of God. Two new books are out. One is called The Presence of God, and the other one is Laying the Axe to the Root. Uh, Both of these publications should be available at the book table so you can pick up copies on your way out. One of the reasons we we like to put it in print so that it's it's just to help us study the Word of God together, right? It's it's easy to just come and preach and go away and then you forget what you heard, but you can take it back. uh, You can study it during the week. You can discuss it in your prayer groups, in your cell groups. You can meditate on it during your uh, personal time. So it really helps reinforce what we are learning on Sunday mornings, what we are discovering from the Word of God. So I'd encourage you to make use of the printed versions, uh, publications that are there. This was a series of messages that we actually shared during our outpouring meetings and uh, in the evenings. Not everybody was there, so I felt it important for us to do it on Sunday mornings here uh, so that all of us as a church can understand and learn and press in to more of God's presence. You know, what we really want to do in this series of studying, studies on the presence of God is help us understand a little bit more about God's presence, how to press into the presence of God, and what will happen to us when we are in God's presence. Now, many of us, you know, we can experience the presence of God privately in our homes. Uh, when you are, you know, maybe you put on a worship CD, you're sitting in your home, you're just reading your Bible or praying or lying on your bed or however you want to do it, privately at home. It can happen in a small group. You know, maybe you're gathered with five, six, or ten believers in your home. You're just having a time of prayer and worship. You can experience the presence of God that way. Or we experience the presence of God when we gather together like this in a larger group setting uh, on a Sunday morning. I don't know if anybody's sitting upstairs, but God bless you if you're sitting upstairs and <laughs> listening. That's one problem. I can't see who's there. And, um, well, if anybody there, they can just watch. All right, so wherever we are, whether you're down here on the ground floor, on the first floor, God's presence can still touch our lives as we, uh, as we worship God together. But the thing is this, we must understand some important things about the presence of God. How to welcome God's presence. What can we expect when you're in His presence and so on. So that's what we want to focus on. So that all of us can have the spiritual and move in it. Uh, in chapter 1, more of God. I will not be doing chapter 1 because uh, we actually preached this whole message several Sundays back. Uh, but I just want to quickly review that. Chapter 1, page 2, more of God. You know, the Bible tells us, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? 
So two things I want to emphasize here. First of all, we haven't tasted all of God. Amen. There is more of God that we can taste. Is that right? God's infinite. Now we've tasted a little bit about God, of God, grace, maybe His healing, maybe His deliverance. We've tasted a little bit about God and that's wonderful. But there's more of God that we can taste. The second thing I want to emphasize is the Bible says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. So much of our Christianity is limited, or our understanding of God is so limited to the realm of knowledge. What we know about God. Now, knowledge is important. You, we need to know things about God. We need to know Him. We need to know the hope of His calling. We need to know the greatness of His power. We need to know. But God doesn't want to be confined to our knowing. He wants to come into the realm of seeing. Taste and see. Come into the realm of experiencing God. Amen? If all we have is knowledge about God, it only equips us to argue with each other. But once it comes down to the realm of experience, I have tasted and I have seen. There's no need for any more debates. Case over. Amen? Why? I have tasted and I have seen. The Lord is good. I don't need to convince myself. I don't need somebody else to argue with me. I have tasted and I have seen God move in a certain way. And therefore, there's no need to argue. There's no need to debate about it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. So God is interested in moving beyond the realm of knowledge into the realm of our experience. Amen? And we must welcome that. Lord, I want to taste and I want to see that you are good. The Bible tells us to do that. So let's press in and say, God, I want to really experience this thing. But in my knowledge, I want it to come into a realm where I am walking in it. I'm experiencing more and more of God. So we need to become hungry for more of God. Become hungry for more of Him. Page 5, God responds to those who are hungry. When you are hungry, God responds. If we will draw near to Him, He will draw near to us. We also talked about how we enter into God's presence. Uh, if you will remember the message that was preached several Sundays ago, how the Old Testament tabernacle of Moses is really a shadow of the true type of the literal that's in the heavens, of the true tabernacle that's in the heavens. This is just a shadow of the real. And so when we follow the Old Testament tabernacle, going from the outer court to the inner court and the most holy place, it teaches us how we must enter in the presence of God. In the outer court, there is a place of a sacrifice. We present our bodies a living sacrifice. There's a place of washing. We wash ourselves with the water of His Word. We come into the inner court where there is the, the showbread, God meeting our daily, giving us our daily bread, meeting our needs. There is the altar of incense, our prayer of, prayers of intercession and, uh, and supplications going up to God. There is the candlesticks, which, gives, which is the illumination of the Holy Spirit, enlightening our hearts and minds. But we are not supposed to stay there as well. We need to go beyond that into the most holy place. Once you get into the most holy place, there is nothing more for you and me to do. Nothing more. No more sacrifice, no more offerings, nothing. All you do is you are in the presence of God and now God does the speaking. You are at the altar where God says, my glory will rest and I will speak to you face to face. Amen? And now we understand in the New Testament that veil has been torn into two. So all of us have 24 act, 24 7 access to the most holy place. And we also saw from the book of Hebrews how our very feelings, our very faith is felt by God in the holy, most holy place. That God sees your feeling. Your faith goes into the most holy place. We saw that from the book of Hebrews. So I'm not going to review that. But here's the key. The Bible says, they that dwell in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So we are not to visit the secret place. We are to dwell there. Amen? So we must learn how to dwell in the Most Holy Place. Remain, abide in the Most Holy Place. And we talked, some of this, we talked, talked about this uh, in, that, in the first chapter. And this brings us to a place of intimacy, page 15, intimacy with the Most High, where we get to know Him. And intimacy produces fruitfulness in our lives. I want to just have a piece here from the first chapter uh, about a Christian monk whose name was Brother Lawrence. He's well known for, um, for the book that's written on the practice of the presence of God. I just want to read an excerpt from there. At the bottom of page 17, going on into page 18. I just want to read an excerpt from there and just encourage us by the life this, this Christian monk, Brother Lawrence, lived. It says this about him, that he was more united to God in his outward employments than when he left them for devotion and retirement. 
His very countenance was edifying, such a sweet and calm devotion appearing in it, as could not but affect the behold. As it was observed that in the greatest hurry of business, in the kitchen, he still preserved his recollection and heavenly mindedness. He was never hasty nor loitering, but did each thing in its season with an even uninterrupted composure and tranquility of spirit. He does not with me from the time of prayer, and in the noise and clutter of my kitchen, while several persons at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were upon my knees at the blessed sacraments. Amen? That means, in as much as I am, you know, he, he might have been very busy working in the kitchen, but he was carrying God's presence with him right there in the busyness of all that he had to do, just as much as when he was in the quietness in the presence of God. Amen? I want to challenge us to do that, to carry the presence of God throughout our day, wherever we are, in school, in college, in work, in busy, you know, business, wherever you are. Carry God's presence. Walk in the peace. Dwell in the secret place of, his, of the Most High God. Now, here's what I want to do this morning, chapter 2, in His presence. What I want to do in this message this morning is help us understand what we can expect happen to us when we are in God's presence. Whether privately in your room, in a small group in your home, or when you gather together like this on a Sunday morning. What can happen to us in the presence of God? And I want to just close by talking about how to tap in to the presence of God. What must we do to have more of God's presence? Are you all with me this morning? Yes? You're all already looking very sleepy, tired after the camp. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about being in His presence. What happens there? No, first of all, in the presence of God, we are changed. We are changed in the presence of God. You know, many times when you come into God's presence, where there's worship happening, nobody needs to lay a hand on you. Nobody needs to say a prayer over you. You being in God's presence is more than enough for you to be changed. Amen. That's it. In God's presence, you're changed. I'm changed. Some of the things, some of the ways in which... Now, the Second Corinthians 3.18 says that as we are beholding in, as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are transformed into that same image from glory to glory. So we are so focused on God. We are looking at His beauty. We are worshipping His greatness. We are just celebrating who God is. We are focusing on Him. And as we behold Him, we are changed into that same image. Whatever is in us, which is not in line with this, then we are in His presence. Amen? In what ways we are changed? One thing that can happen to us is a deep conviction can come. Suddenly, as you're in the presence of God, things that you didn't bother about, you thought was okay, you kind of never dealt with, kind of maybe slept under the carpet, um, at, at that moment, conviction comes. God puts us for our lives. Adam in the temple, Adam and his wife, in the presence of the message, sinners of an angry God, wasn't doing any of this. this was just the most he called up to say, Adam, where are you? Even as his spirit began to move in the garden, a conviction came and Eve, and they went, in they went into hiding. Conviction comes in the very presence of God. Amen? No word is spoken, no message is preached. Nobody comes and hits you with the Bible on the head. You're just in the presence of God, and you're being convicted of something in your life. It happens to us as believers. Happens to anybody, even an unsaved person comes in. That's why we welcome even, you know, bring your friends into the presence of God. You know, I might be talking about something very far-fetched, which no, they will never understand. But it's okay. Why? God's presence, if, because God's presence is here, that is more than enough to bring conviction on their lives. They may understand zero of what I'm talking about, but that's okay. So bring, you just bring anyone in here. Let them sit in the presence of God. In God's presence, conviction comes. Now it happens to us believers as well. You know, maybe there are issues in our life we are, not, we are trying to avoid. And God begins to put his finger on that. Psalm, uh, in Psalm 51, David prayed this way. He said, Lord, don't hide your face from my sin. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my sins. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit with me. Do not take me away from your presence. So he's crying out for the presence of God. He, in the midst of a conviction of sin, he's still asking for the presence of God. A great example is that of 
Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, you know, uh, or rather Isaiah, yeah, Isaiah 6, he, he has a vision of God. His first response in Isaiah 6, 5 is, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. I have seen God face to face. First response when I encounter with God's presence, I'm convicted of my sin. So, uh, conviction of sin comes, we're changed through that. Sometimes we're changed through brokenness. You know, when you're in the presence of God, all of a sudden you, you begin to feel, uh, you begin to have a sense of how great God is and how small you and I are. A sense of brokenness. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.29 that no flesh will glory in God's presence. Amen? So that means when you're in the presence of God, all of a sudden, you know, all this big reputation you had, all the trust and confidence we had in our own abilities and etc., suddenly this, this seems to melt and we stand in God's presence. God, I've got nothing to boast about. My achievement, nothing to are okay, God. You feel brokenness. Sometimes you're crying. Sometimes you just words come out of your mouth. Thank God. Allow to really seep into you because those moments of brokenness, God you into a surrender in some area of life. Just like that. say, God, thank you. I see your presence. I who I am. Great you are. Welcome that life. It's you experiencing the presence of God. the presence of God. There is joy. There is sin. We are changed. Fiction. Brokenness. But we also change feelings of joy. No, we all joy, but we're to express it. We want joy. Mother Peter says, so, Hallelujah. Express joy. Mother tells us in 16, verse, In your sins, in full of an over of joy. Exuberant excitement. All these are expressions of you experiencing joy in your life. Yeah. The presence of God. The joy of God is flooding. You want half? Nobody said a joke. Preaching Hebrew and, and you want half. Why? Not because it was a you were filled with the joy of the Lord. The joy moving upon in God's presence, filling you with the joy. And you express so many ways. In dancing, laughing, running, in many ways, releasing the joy of the Lord. Anoint the oil of gladness. Oil of gladness. Amen. So when you're with this oil, oil of gladness, just um, a facet of the Holy Spirit. And anointed the gladness, you got some gladness. However, it might be jumping, shouting, running around. This, this glad bubbling out of you is being touched by the presence of God. Many, many references to the Bible. I've just had one here when Solomon was being made king with David, Zedok the priest, and Nathan the prophet. The Bible records, the people played the flutes and rejoiced with great joy so that the earth seemed to split with their sound. That's 1 Kings 1 40. The earth seemed to split with the sound that they were making. We haven't reached there yet. Amen? It must have been really loud. Then expressing the joy that the earth seemed to split with the sound they were making. There are about 37 times in the book of Psalms, the Bible says, shout for joy. It doesn't say how loud you have to shout. It just says shout for joy. The implication is shout as loud as you can. Shout for joy, the Bible says. Shout joyfully to the Lord. Now when you are touched with this kind of presence of God and, and, and you are filled with joy, and however you want to express that joy, go ahead and release it. Something happens. It's not just a, you know, a, a, an exuberant expression, but something happens to you and me. What is joy to? Joy brings release. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Joy brings strength. Proverbs 17.22 says that it brings us wholeness. It's, it says, you know, the, a merry heart does good like medicine. It brings healing. It brings wholeness. Joy liberates. God gives us the garment of praise to displace the spirit of heaviness. Amen? So when you're in the presence of God and, and, and we are being changed, it could come through conviction, it could come through a feeling of brokenness, or it could come through a, a, a release of joy. But the whole objective is to change you, change me through these experiences. Amen? I want to encourage us, yield yourself to it. When you feel conviction, yield to it. When you feel brokenness, yield to it. When you feel joy, yield to it. Why? The end result is something in you will change. Something in me will change. Second thing that's happened to us in the presence of God, you and I are familiar with this, page 22. We are renewed in our strength. You know, when you come in on Sunday morning, you know, don't just come into service or when you gather together and say, okay, you know, okay, God, you know, I'll go there. 
yeah, 10 30 service, 12 30, I'll go, one o'clock, I'll go to, you know, I'll go to Empire, I'll go to Richie's, now the name is changed, so wherever, you know, so you're more focused on where you're going to go at one o'clock after those two hours. You know, you're anticipating what happens at one o'clock after the service. But I want you to forward that anticipation to those two hours that you spend in God's presence. God, today I'm going to worship you. I'm going to be in your presence. I want something in my life. And I spend those two hours or whatever time in your presence. Amen. I may be changed or I might be renewed in my strength. Maybe you're coming, you're tired. You had a very rough week. The week ahead see, looks as equally rough. And, and you just need to be renewed in your strength. The Bible says that God gives strength to those who are weak. He gives power to the weak. To those who have no might, He increases strength. The Bible says those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They will run. They'll have endurance. Not get tired. They will walk, they will not faint. Amen. So expect that. Lord, as I am in your presence, I want to be renewed in my strength. I'm feeling a little tired. My strength is growing weary. I'm feeling weary, God. I want to be renewed. I want my strength to be renewed. Come with that expectation when you spend. Now, it could happen in private, in your own room. It could happen in a small group, in your home. Or it can happen on Sunday morning. The point is we must expect this to take place as we're in the presence of God. Amen? Third, we are refreshing. He says that of refreshing. Multiple reasons. Of Not that he says, no, I went from 2008. Oh, refreshing. Hallelujah. It doesn't have just one of refreshing. So you have reason of refreshing. Another other season. Reasons. An over of refreshing. You being refreshed. They come from the presence of God. So every time you get into this presence of God, you can have a new season of refreshing. Being refreshed. It's like waking up in the morning. Majority of us will agree that when you wake up in the morning, you feel refreshed. Amen? You're ready for the day. You had a good night's sleep. You're awake. You're ready for the day. You're refreshed. The same thing in the spirit. You're refreshed in the presence of God. Number four, as we spend time in God's presence, miracles take place. Miracles take place. Just give one, one reference there. In Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, 37th verse, it says, Because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them. He brought them out of Egypt with his presence, with his mighty power. So you see, the presence of God and the power of God are equated. The God's presence is also the place of his mighty power. It's, all the place of, it's also the place of His mighty power. So many times I'm saying, Look, where, where, where do I find the power of God? God's power is in His presence. So as you get to God, whether at home, a small group in church, as you get in the presence of God and you're welcoming God's presence, it's also the place of His mighty power. So you can expect, even without anybody laying hands on you, without anybody praying over you, you can expect His mighty power to affect your life in God's presence. Amen. His presence is the place of His power. Number five, there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, 11 says, In your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand. So now you're in the presence of God. You have access to His right hand. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So it's not a list of five pleasures you can receive. It's pleasures forevermore. Meaning, this list goes on and on. It's an unending list of pleasures that are at His right hand. Pleasures forevermore. For whom? For you and for me. It isn't God's just keeping there and enjoying it Himself. In His presence, we experience fullness of joy. So the implication there is, we receive the come from His right hand. Amen? The right hand of the Lord, the Bible tells us, is a place of honor. It's a place of power. His right hand brings deliverance, gives great victories. It demonstrates His right hand releases mighty works and abundant blessings to His people. So these are pleasures. I mean, that means there is no real reason why you should have it. But God just gives it anyway. Amen? Now some people get so upset when they find out that somebody had gold teeth given to them in the presence of God. They want a logical explanation. Why would God give somebody gold teeth? 
Well, give me a logical explanation. Why would God pave his streets with gold? You're going to be walking on gold, treating it like dirt in heaven. You call these pleasures. You don't have to have a reason why God gives gold teeth to people. You don't have to have a reason why God does certain things. These are just pleasures, things he just likes to do because he's God. Amen? See, God's pleasures are forevermore. I mean, this is, this is an unending list of good things that God does for his people. We don't always have to know, why did God do this for that person? Pleasures forevermore. I'm just pleased to do it. Amen? And the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, the 64th chapter, verses 1 uh, through 4, when God rains the heavens and comes down, He says, You did awesome things for which we did not look for. God did awesome things that we were not even looking for these things. I mean, we weren't even asking for it. We weren't looking. God began to think in His presence. In the heavens, He came down, He began to do things. So that you can expect, just, I just want to pour out your pleasure life. As I'm in you know, number six, page 24, evil is overpowered. When you are in, and I are in the presence of God, God's presence is powerful. Evil is overpowered. Isaiah 19 and verse 1 says this, The burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. And the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. The idols they represent demonic powers. It says these demonic powers will totter, will tremble, will shake at his presence. When God's presence moves in, evil shakes, evil trembles. Amen? So welcome everyone, you know, let's have all the Satanists and all of them come to APC in the morning, Sunday morning. Don't be afraid. It's okay, let them come and sit. Because we know that the powers of darkness tremble at the presence of God. Amen? Welcome them in. Give them front row seats. Let's not get afraid. No, we, sometimes we are so funny. We people are so funny. We get afraid. Somebody else comes into our services. Ooh, that person, look what all he's wearing. Look how he's smelling. Or see how he's smelling. We get afraid that he's coming to us. No, welcome them in. Why? Because, hey, when God's presence is here, it says the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. Amen. His presence. You focus on welcoming his presence. Let them come and sit here. Let them experience what God can do. Amen. I mean, even if they are full of demons, don't have to worry. They will be delivered just sitting in the presence of God. Amen. So I think we must fill our churches with those kinds of people. Amen. Let them bring them in. Let them sit here. Let's worship God. I mean, what are the greater way to bring deliverance to people en masse? Amen. The idols of it, the powers of darkness will tremble at the presence of God. It's a great example here in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel chapter 5, Dagon was a Philistine God and uh, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Testimony, which is a symbol of God's presence. And they said, we will take it and put it right next to Dagon. They came in the morning, found Dagon. It's not so much about the idol telling us that the presence of God had shaken the powers of darkness. Amen. And in the presence of God, evil will be overpowered. In your own personal life, expect this. Psalm 9 verse 3 says, My enemies turn back. They will fall and perish at your presence. At your presence. My enemies will fall. I don't have to chase them. Just God's presence will take care of them. You carry the presence of God. That's all. Psalm 17 verse 2 says, Let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are pride. Your vindication. Maybe there are accusers. Maybe there are uh, allegations, false allegations coming against you. What do you do? Let your vindication come from the presence of God. Don't worry. You carry the presence of God. You be in His presence. His vindication comes for you from His presence. Last two things. Number seven. In the presence of God, we are actually dwelling, residing with the Most High. This is very, very familiar to us. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells, that means he's made up his residence, 
in the secret place of the Most High. He will abide under the shadow or the overcovering protection of the Almighty. So what is the secret place of the Most High? Other places in Psalms enlighten us on that. Psalm 27 verse 5 says, In the secret place of His tabernacle. The presence of God. The tabernacle is the dwelling place, the presence of God. So the secret place is the presence of God. Psalm 31 verse 20. In the secret place of your presence, you will hide me in the secret place of your presence. So the secret place of the Most High is simply the presence of the Most High. So if you dwell, reside in the presence of the Most High, what's happening? It says you will come under the overcovering protection of God. And all the other blessings in Psalm 91, which you and I are very familiar with, they all follow because of dwelling in the presence of the Most High God. Amen. It's open for all of us. In your personal time at home, you just dwell in the presence of God. Say, God, I want to enjoy your presence. Last one. We are empowered in the presence of God to go forth and serve Him. Mark chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Jesus called His 12 disciples. He wanted them to be with Him. So first, be with me. Then I send you out to preach and give you power to heal sicknesses and cast out demons. And you see the result of that later on in Acts, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, you and I are familiar with it, that uh, the, the council, they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they took note that these were uneducated and ignorant men, but they realized that these men had been with Jesus. They had been with him. So now they had this boldness, they had the power to heal. Where did it come from? Because they were with him. Same thing happens to you and me. When we are with him, we receive the power to serve him. So now, all these wonderful things take place in the presence of God. I want you to expect this. Amen? When we come here on Sunday mornings, you know, don't just say, okay, two hours. I know 45 minutes of worship to seven songs. The Spirit leads eight songs. I know all that. I forget all that. You are in the presence of God. Amen? As you know, I thank God for the one month we have. The wonderful musicians are better than me most of the time. <laughs> I thank God for the But something goes you know, start squeaking, uh, power off, uh, all these disturbances, something happen now and then. Don't get upset. You didn't come to music. You came in the presence of God. Amen. And even if it was often behind the music, some, some, you don't have to come seeking God's. What is what you're after? Because in presence, all awful things happen. Change. You are strengthened. You are rest. Empowered. Miracle stick. You receive vision that plays your right hand. All these wonderful things available to you in his presence. You just continue. Just go on in his presence. Well, how do we tap in to the presence of God? Two things that we find in scripture. Jesus said this in, in John 7, 37 to 39. He said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If you thirst, come and drink. Now, he is using language that we understand in our everyday world to tell us something that we are supposed to be doing in the realm of the spirits. Right? So he's not talking about, you know, Jesus is not standing in the, car, in the service and saying, here, here's some drink, water, drink. He said, this is not a natural thing. But he's talking about something about we have to do in the spirit. If you are thirsty for God's presence, come and drink. So that you and I have to, we have to reach out, we have to drink in the spirit. Amen? So this is some action involved. And John 7, 37, 39 continues. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's saying, if you are thirsty, come to me. And if you're drinking, what will happen? You have an overflow. The nice thing about this in the Spirit is, you can keep on thirsting, you can keep on drinking, and you can keep on overflowing. You know? You're full, you're still thirsty. You're full and overflowing, but you're still thirsty. That's in the Spirit. It's interesting. You're full. You're overflowing, but you're still thirsty in the Spirit. If you're thirsty, come and drink. So there's an action involved in receiving the presence of God, in receiving the Holy Spirit working in your life. And when you drink, you're overflowing. It's flowing out of you. So how do you do that? He says, if you are thirsty, so you've got to say, Lord, I'm thirsty. Lord, when you come into the presence of God, whether it's on a Sunday morning or at home, wherever you are, say, God, your presence. What is that? It's you saying, Lord, I am. 
Lord, I want your presence. I want your presence now, Lord. And I want to experience this in my life. Maybe it's a change. Maybe it's a healing. Maybe it's a running of strength. Maybe it's just joy. Whatever it is, God, I want your presence. It's you telling God, I am thirsty. If you're not thirsty, let him come. So you get in the presence of God. And what? Drink. That means you receive. So you say, Lord, I receive your presence that will strengthen my life. I receive your presence that will bring refreshing. The drinking. And Jesus will not put cups of water and say, enough for to come back next Sunday. No. Much as you desire, you drink. Drink to overflow to the point where you're now, it's not flowing out of you and blessing other people. And you keep on thirsting, keep on drinking, keep on overflowing. So it's you are hungry for God and saying, God, I want your presence. I'm thirsty. And Lord, I'm receiving. I'm thirsty. Lord, I receive. Change my life changed my life. You're receiving, you're drinking. Right? So that's one way of tapping into God's presence by thirsting and drinking. Thirsting and drinking. Thirsting and drinking. You're tapping into the presence of God for your life. There's the other thing that the Bible teaches us. The Bible talks about waiting. They that wait upon the Lord. And in the book of Psalms, there are several times, at least about 70 times, the word, the psalm uses the word Selah. In the middle of his psalm, you might find Selah. Selah simply means pause. Be quiet. Don't talk to God in Hebrew or Greek. Calm down. Be still. Don't try to impress God with all the verses you know. It's okay. He knows the Bible. I mean, just relax. Be still. Just remain still. In God's presence. So we use this more word, the word that you and I understand, soaking. So waiting and soaking in God's presence is another way by which you allow God to work in your life. You now sometimes during our worship time, we just come up, the worship theme just keeps playing. We don't say anything, don't sing a song. You're wondering, what are they doing? Oh, no, what are they singing? When will they finish? No, no, no. It's a time for you just to say a lot. In God's presence. We're not singing any words. We're not singing any words. We're not saying anything. What are we doing? We just say la. Just wait. Just soak in the presence of God. Just be still. Don't have to say many words. If you want to pray, pray very silently a few words. But your heart is fixed on God. Adoring Him. Your mind is engaged with thoughts your sailor. You're not thinking about yourself, you're not thinking about your problems, you're not thinking about anything else. You're just waiting on God. I like what Todd Bentley wrote about this back in 2006. He, he wrote about waiting and soaking the presence of the Lord. I'd just like to read that out for us here. It's on page 27. It's really interesting. I mean, he's just putting it in our modern language, something that you and I can understand. He says, what our ministry is today can be attributed to a period of three months that I spent soaking of Almighty God. It was a time of incredible visitation when I encountered God in what I call the glory liquid honey cloud of His presence. For about three months, there was grace upon my prayer life, where for anything from four to twelve hours a day, all I could do was lie and be still in His presence. I called it soaking. All I was doing was positioning myself away from the clamor of everyday life and seeking God. Not that I wanted to. I began by praying in hunger, pressing in for the power of God to bring me revival. I kept saying, Holy Spirit, please come. God, you said if I would draw near to you, you would draw near to me. You said if I would seek you and search for you with all my heart, I'd find you. God, I am pressing in violently, aggressively. I am not letting go. It was a radical pursuit of God's presence, crying out, seeking. I was desperately in search of the Lord, and I was pursuing His glory. It was a time of holy hunger and a time of extreme anxiety. Mine was a holy desperation for Him as a person, and I was determined to be deeper in His glory than I had ever been before. I wanted to experience His presence in, in a way that I had never known, and I had purposed in my heart to have an encounter with Him unlike any other that I had before. I did everything that I could. I prayed in tongues for hours. I mean prayed. With praise, 
intercession, supplication. I would make my requests known to God. When I decided to pray an hour, I would pray an hour. And I was loud about it. I was pressing in and I wanted a breakthrough. I wanted God and I knew how to sense His presence. But I was never satisfied with where I had been. I wasn't content with what I had seen. I said, Lord, I want more. And I pressed in. I was almost in a place of striving. Soaking is mainly quietness, listening, and waiting. There is a similarity between marinating, which many of the ladies will understand, and soaking in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Let's learn how to marinate in the Holy Ghost sauce. That means to be in His presence with no thought of self, resting in His glory, and letting Him, well, pickle us. Godly pickling takes time, maybe weeks, and to soak for a long time before we are really tender. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.